let's talk about wireless networking. Wireless networking technologies are becoming very, very popular today. It allows us to implement a network without having to pull wire. And that saves a great deal of time and money. If you've ever had to pull wire for a network, you know that it's a dirty, time-consuming, basically not very fun job. With wireless, we get to skip all that. Instead of using copper or fiber optic cabling, we use radio frequency wireless technology, radio waves, as the medium for transferring data. For this reason, we sometimes call wireless an unbounded medium. Our wired media, such as fiber optic, coaxial, twisted pair, are a card called bounded media. Wireless is one type of unbounded media. Now, wireless networks in the USA use frequency ranges that are specified by the Federal Communications Commission for industrial, scientific, and medical frequencies. These are sometimes abbreviated as ISM frequencies. These include the 2.4 gigahertz range, the 5.8 gigahertz range, the 5.15, gigahertz range, the 5.25 gigahertz range, and the 5.725 gigahertz range. Most of the wireless networking equipment you're going to work with operates in the 2.4 gigahertz range. The wireless networking standards we use to implement a wireless network are specified in the 802.11 standard. Now, within the standard, there are several subspecifications that you need to be familiar with. The first one is 802.11b. The 802.11b standard specifies a radial frequency of 2.40 gigahertz to 2.4835 gigahertz. It operates at a speed of 11 megabits per second, and it has a range of around 280 to 300 feet. That's ideal range, by the way. This is heavily, heavily impacted by structural issues, such as, you know, if you're inside of a room that has concrete walls, you're not going to get 280 feet out of that. You're going to get much, much less. You're signal is probably going to end pretty close to the wall itself. If you're outside with no impediments whatsoever, then you probably will get the full 280 to 300 feet. Anything in between, drywall, wood walls, etc., reduce this range slightly, although not as badly as heavier materials like concrete. 802.11b was the first really widely implemented wireless networking standard. For a while, that's pretty much what you bought. When you bought wireless networking equipment, it was 802.11b. Now, one of the problems with 802.11b is its speed. It runs at 11 megabits per second, which is equivalent to an older 10 megabits Ethernet network. It works, but it's kind of slow. To enhance the speed, a newer standard has come out called 802.11g. Like 802.11b, 802.11g uses the 2.40 gigahertz to 2.4835 gigahertz frequency range. However, instead of running at 11 megabits per second, it runs at 54 megabits per second. Still not as fast as, say, a wired fast Ethernet network that runs at 100 megabits per second but we're doing a lot better than 11 megabits per second. By the way, this speed is a theoretical maximum speed. It can be heavily impacted by interference. One of the great problems with 802.11, either at B or G, is the fact that other consumer wireless devices use one or more frequencies inside the same range. A big killer for 802.11 networks are wireless phone systems. Some wireless phone systems use many of the frequencies in here which cause interference with your wireless network. And by the way, it goes the other way too. The wireless network interferes with the wireless phone system. I've seen this happen many times. You're saving a file, a big file on your wireless laptop or on your wireless network system. You pick up the telephone, try to make a call with a wireless phone, and you hear a lot of clicks and pops 
through the telephone. That's because not only was the phone interfering with the laptop, but the laptop was also interfering with the phone. The range of 802.11g is pretty much the same, slightly longer, probably around 300 feet or so, again, depending on where and how it's implemented. 802.11b, when it first came out, was very widely implemented, and there's still a lot of 802.11b equipment out there. However, it's getting a lot of pressure from 802.11g because of its higher speed. One of the nice things about 802.11g equipment, usually, depending on the manufacturer, is that it's backwards compatible with 802.11b equipment. So you can upgrade your wireless access point to a G and still use your 802.11b um, network interfaces with it and upgrade them over time. With that, we need to talk about the different type of equipment we need to implement when we are working with wireless networks. The first thing we need to work with is a wireless network board. Now, depending on what kind of system you're implementing this in, it can take a variety of different forms. Just like with a wired network where we have to use a NIC, with a wireless network, we got to use a NIC. However, it's a special type of NIC. Instead of having a wire connected to the back, it's got a radio antenna. Now, for laptop systems, a lot of the newer laptop notebook systems have the wireless network board already built in. The antenna is built into the LCD panel itself. Works really well. If it doesn't have a built-in wireless interface, you can add a PCMCIA card that also provides a wireless interface. For a desktop system, you can use one of two other methods. You can use a PCI card that's installed into an expansion slot. It has an antenna on the back that's used to communicate with your wireless access point. In addition, you can also use an external USB device that also provides a wireless connection through your USB port. So we have our wireless network interface inside of our host that we're going to communicate on the network. Now, we also have to have a central connecting point. When we're dealing with a wired Ethernet network, we wire it, at least with the newer Ethernet standards, in a physical star type of topology. We have a central connecting point. We connect all the different workstations to that central connecting point, which is a hub or switch, with a piece of wire, usually twisted pair wiring. Well, a wireless network uses the same topology. We have a central connecting point and that central connecting point is called a wireless access point, or WAP, W-A-P. However, instead of connecting to this WAP with a wire, we connect using the wireless network interface that we installed in all of our systems using radio waves. Now, as you can see, the basic topology is the same between a wired Ethernet twisted pair network and a wireless 802.11 network. It's just that we use radio waves instead of wiring. Now, a WAP functions basically like a wireless hub, allowing wireless NICs to connect to the wireless access point. When you go down to buy a wireless access point at your local computer store, more than likely what you're going to find is a hybrid. It has a wireless connector. It probably has an antenna right here that's used to pick up these radio signals, but it also has ports that can be used for a wired network, making it very handy. It allows you to integrate both a wired system, such as this, with a wireless system. And they all interact together as though they use the same medium. The wireless access point intermediates between the wireless signal and the wired signal. In addition, depending on what you buy, they may also include routing functionality that allows you to connect the wireless access point with another network. Got a little built-in router. This is used frequently for home or small business networks that connect to a DSL line, for instance, so that all these hosts on this network can share that internet connectivity through the DSL line. It's important that you understand that you don't actually have to use a wireless access point in a wireless network. The 802.11 standard allows you to configure wireless networks in one of two different ways. The first way is called ad hoc mode, or sometimes called peer-to-peer -peer mode. It's not implemented all that frequently, however, it can be done. In ad hoc mode, a wireless access point is not used. Instead, the wireless network interface cards in each of the hosts communicate directly with each other. Now, this type of wireless network is really fast to implement. It's really easy to implement. However, it's got some drawbacks. First of all, you can't connect to a wireless network unless one of the hosts happens to have 
a wired network interface card and then is connected to a hub or a switch and it has some form of routing software installed that allows you to communicate between the ad hoc wireless network and the wired network. The other problem really with ad hoc is the fact that if, if the network gets very large, if it has more than just a few hosts, it becomes completely unmanageable. Instead, when we're dealing with a large network, we usually implement wireless networks in infrastructure mode. And this is the most frequently implemented form of wireless network. With infrastructure mode, we use a wireless access point as the central connecting point for the wireless NICs. All communications between hosts go through the wireless access point. And it's much more scalable than an ad hoc network. You can connect many, many hosts to it. You can connect two wireless networks together and you can connect it easily to a wired network. The drawback is that it takes a little more